Well, folks, thanks for joining me tonight. You've got another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. Regular listeners will know that I'm trying my best to hit these audio cues, and nevertheless, I've managed to just butcher them pretty routinely. So I start each episode very serious. And like, I'm very focused. I click record. I go over. I hit the audio cue. And then as soon as I hear that tune, I just start smiling. I start like my shoulders start moving. It's a catchy little number. I, it puts a smile on my face like so many things do. It's true. But still, thanks to Peter Trulin for giving us that amazing uh, intro music. It, it brightens my day every time I hear for it. Looks like Chris has a smile on his face, too. Uh, not, 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 no stranger to that. Um, so I've derailed us a little, but I thought it was important to share that information with the group. Um, this is the Rec Poker Podcast. Welcome to the Forums Edition. Uh, every week, we take a different post from our forums here at Rec.Poker and talk about it on the air. Uh, my name is Jim Reed. I'm Bluffsterini in the home game and Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. You get used to hearing my voice because I host the podcast, but I'm just one of the members here that make up the Wrecking Crew. We do count on this leadership group, the Wrecking Crew, uh, some fantastic folks that love poker as much as I do. And are, most of them are much better at playing it and talking to people about it. That's why I'm so great, uh, so grateful to have them here on the show with me tonight. Uh, if you want to find out more about the Wrecking Crew and myself, you can go to rec.poker slash crew. But just listen up because you're going to meet a few of them here right now. Well, I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5b5 on Twitter or 5 by 5 in the Poker Stars home game. I'm Rob Washam. You can find me as Rabman50 just about everywhere. Taylor Moss. I'm on Twitter at, at Taylor underscore Moss and go for boy TJM in the Rec Poker home game. And I know everyone's thinking, but Jim, Rec Poker is a largely volunteer based organization. Most of what you do there is free. Um, how do you make it happen without your sponsors? <laughs> Thank you so much for the reminder, folks. If it wasn't for uh, like a running aces hotel, racetrack and casino, there's just no way we could do what we do here. Um, we rely on their support. Um, this hand that we're going to look at tonight is actually from a Running Aces poker uh, tournament. And so I'm excited to be, uh, we don't have I'm a Luigi on the show tonight, Louis Hillman. We kind of teased him at the uh, last week's episode, uh, but Louis is a fantastic follow on Twitter. Um, he's a prolific poster in the Rock Poker forums. He's a beast on the felt, and he's no stranger to the winning uh, winner's circle over at Running Aces. So thanks to Running Aces for your support. And thanks to Louis Hillman uh, for posting this spot. So this is a post in our forums. Again, our, our forums here are free to join. They're just like some uh, one of the many uh, free things that we do here. Discord, the home games, the YouTube videos, um, a ton of different training opportunities and social events. Uh, it's free to come join, come sign up. All it takes is an email address and a smile, but both are compulsory. Uh, so this is a spot Louis posted. It's from 800 uh, dollar no limit tournament this past weekend at running aces there were 390 entrants we're down to 15 so we're already in the money and uh, the payouts are relatively flat until the top eight so like a lot of poker tournaments most of the money is at the final table you can get paid uh, incrementally getting up to that point but if you really want to crush it results wise you got to make final tables you got to know how to how to get a big stack early so that you can get there and then you got to know how to run when you get to the final table so this is in this uh weird spot in the tournament where with 15 players left they're starting to get shorthanded so you've got six uh, seven players at one table and eight at another and as you get closer and closer to the final table of nine each table gets shorter and shorter handed um and less experienced poker players might not be used to this dynamic but you end up playing like six-handed and five-handed for a while before you make the final table. And that does kind of drastically change how often you're playing hands, uh, how big the pots are with antes and that kind of thing. And it, I'm not sure how relevant that is to what we're going to talk about today, but it's, it's something that I know um, our Reckoning Crew members and Louis Hillman are going to be very familiar with. So, uh, Villain is a thinking semi-pro player who just won the Fall Poker Classic at Canterbury a few months ago. So Louie doesn't dox this player, but if you if you know poker in Minnesota, you probably know who this is. He's the toughest opponent at my table and, unlucky for me, on my direct left. I had been limping, this is Louie speaking here, I had uh, limped most blinds versus blinds situations, including the last orbit where I had ace-king, was planning to limp raise, but he checked behind. Uh, Louie ended up winning that hand at showdown 
which only had one street of betting, just as an FYI, on some history between them. So this other player has seen Louis limping with Ace King from the small blind and then getting to showdown uh, with it. So this hand is, starts at 10,000, 20,000 blinds with a 20,000 ante, and they both start the hand with 800,000, so about 40 big blinds. Hero raises from the small blind, so it folds around to Louis in the small blind. Uh, Louis elects to raise this time to 65K, which is just a little over 3X, 3.25X. And um, it is sort of common, again, I'll just, for, for listeners that aren't as experienced with this difference between uh, flatting the small blind and raising, if you're open raising from the small blind, typically you wanna choose a slightly larger sizing than you would if you were gonna be in a late position, because you don't wanna give the big blind a really, really good price to close the action with a call and be in position all hand. You're gonna be out of position, so you should bump that size up a little bit to make a tougher decision for them. And that's what Louis is doing here by opening to uh, 3.25 big blinds. Um, we have the ace of spades, eight of clubs. Uh, the villain de defends just by calling. So on the flop, there's 150K in the middle. It comes jack of spades, five of spades, and a four of some dirty garbage suit. Doesn't even matter what it is. It's not a spade. We don't need to get into it. Um, the hero bets half pot and the villain calls. The turn is the nine of spades. There's 300,000 in the pot. So the board is jack of spades, five of spades, four X and nine of spades. We are holding the ace of spades, eight of clubs. So this is the first real decision point. I mean, I guess we could argue about how to play the flop. Does anyone want to talk about flop options or should we just dive right into the action on the turn? Taylor? I, I have a lot that I want to talk about with this hand. I, I think this is a really cool and fun, and interesting hand, but why don't you go through everything and then uh, we can always loop back. Yeah, all right, cool. Um, so the turn's the nine of spades. There's three spades on the board. We've got the ace of spades. Uh, so the hero checks. I'll just, I'll just go through the hand and I'll just say what happens here. So the hero checks and the villain bets about two thirds pie. Louis says, I considered a check raise jam, but ended up tank folding. Could have taken a different direction in just about every spot of this hand. <laughs> uh, curious to hear what you would do differently and why. Uh, and he does tease us and say that the villain did show his hand, uh, but I will save the results until after the debate. And we don't mind that at all, Louis. We like a little spoiler in the, in the, in the forum. So the, the part that I think Louis is getting at is when you've got the ace of spades and there's three spades on the board, you've got two things. You've got the blocker to the nut flush, which means that your opponent cannot have the nut flush. Whatever he can have, they cannot have the nut flush and that's powerful. The other thing you have is you have a draw to the nut flush with one more card to come. If it comes a spade and there's four spades on the board, assuming that nothing's paired, you're going to end up with uh, the nut hand, the, the nut high flush there. So it's it's a spot that comes up specifically with aces as they relate to the suit on the board. And it's something that's worthy of some conversation. Um, so Chris, you had a, an excellent response to this. And it starts with agreeing with Louis pre-flop. And I think this is a good hand to open with because it's got an ace blocker, it's going to be ahead of a lot of our opponent's calling range. So it's a value raise. And um, it's not, it's a hand that also benefits from some folds just because it's not, you can't make flushes, you can't make straights. Uh, it's the kind of hand that would rather just win a small pot. Um, maybe I'm butchering that, but but Chris, why don't you save me and take, take it from there? Yeah, I mean, to be clear, I don't, I think you could actually, complete this too but i i don't mind a raise with this hand i think it's a, it's a, it's a strong candidate to have the raise and i think on the flop um this is a squibble but i think this is a hand or in a spot that we can bet small a little bit smaller than what we bet here um i think that's going to accomplish the same things you know we've been talking a lot uh this month is about c bet sizing and i think mm -hmm. this is this is a perfect example of a type of hand that um really doesn't doesn't need to go big here 
Um, and we, especially with that ace of spades in our hand, um, it doesn't quite, it, you know, like sometimes we hear like, oh, it's a dynamic flop. It's got, it's two tone. So I should go bigger. But I think this is one, especially in these kind of late stage ICM spots, um, we can put an immense amount of pressure on people by betting small. Um, but I think the more interesting question comes in the turn, but if we can, why don't we, let's talk about pre and, and flop. If anyone else has any takes on that or disagrees with me. Yeah. I, I, I mean, just thinking about the stage of the tournament here, um, I think there's a lot of ICM pressure that's kind of just looming out there. <clears throat> Two tables remaining. I think it's just natural to go, you know, a little bit above three X with our opens here. I, I think I would just go three X flat or maybe even like slightly under uh, a three X for an open, just cause you know, the pressure that's out there is going to accomplish roughly the same. And then like Chris is saying on the flop, like, yeah, I'm going way smaller than this. Like uh, he bet out 75 K, which was half pot. Like I'm, I might be going like 40 K uh like two two big blinds flat here uh because i think it's going to accomplish the same thing yep. like i i don't think not too much is going to change on our sizing here um so i want to go smaller here just pretty much with like everything that i have uh for a lot of the same reasons around pressure and like what it means icm wise uh because we don't necessarily want like we have 800k we've got 40 bigs we don't want to be playing 40 big blind pots uh at this stage of the tournament unless we've got like the nuts uh and you know let's let's go smaller here and just keep putting some small chip pressure on our opponent yeah really i really agree. about icms icm spots that talk about um spots where you bet big in a chip ev situation you bet smaller in an icm situation and if you bet smaller in an ICM situation, you actually get to places where you just check. So it, everything decreases um, in, in its intensity the closer you get, well, especially this, because you're actually in an ICM spot. I don't know what the breakdown of the payoffs are, but um, you know, it, there are, there are going to be pay jumps until we get to the final table. So everything needs to be trimmed down a little bit. So I, I agree 100% that you know, maybe uh, three and a half is a little much. You don't really need to do that at this stage. And I definitely agree that you don't want to go half pot on the uh, on the flop bet. I think, you know, uh, Taylor mentioned, you know, um, 40K. I think between 40 and 50, somewhere in there is probably a nice sweet spot um, to put a bet in. You can also go min bet here. You could go just mm -hmm. one big blind and not, and not be making a mistake. So um, saving yourself some chips. And I think you're just gonna get the same call regardless of how much you put in here. I don't think he's gonna raise. If he was gonna raise, he was gonna raise. So I think, um, yeah, I think we could go smaller here on the flop. Yeah, and and this, I, yeah, take it. Okay. Uh, the, the flop here too like if we think about this like a jack five four uh when we hold ace eight it seems like oh man we just like whiffed on this but i think it whiffs a lot of their calling range too like they called uh this a big raise uh pre-flop um what would they potentially call with that connects here well they're going to call with a lot of suited cards uh so if they have the spade varieties that hits because that has a flush draw uh, but they also call with a lot of suited hands that are hearts, diamonds, clubs, uh, which are going to involve a lot of folds. Uh, obviously, they're going to continue if they ever hit a jack. And they're probably continuing if they hit a five or a four, especially uh, given the, the um, description we have of the opponent, like they're going to call with any pair, uh, given that they're a pretty uh, solid player. So they're going to call with other pairs. Then they're probably also going to call with, you know, some other like somewhat connected hands. They're probably going to call with like queen tens, uh, king queens, uh, maybe even some like 10 nines uh, and stuff like that. So we have to be aware of that. But like ace eight's doing all right uh, versus any of those calls and any like immediate folds we can get from all that other junk, the other like suited heart, suited club combos. Like, yeah, that's going to be great for us. So um, 
And some people might be out there like, oh, you know, Jack 5-4, why, why aren't we checking? And all of us like unanimously were like, yeah, we're going to bet and we're going to bet small. Uh, but it's all about the board texture uh, that we're looking at here because the board texture just like essentially favors in a way that like not much changed. And we essentially said, hey, we've got range advantage pre, you got, you just called. It should stay true on this flop as well. And one of the things that I've learned uh, from Chris Jones over the last couple months of uh, putting together the deep dive seminars that we produce about a month in advance, so I've already got a sneak peek at March, is that uh, board texture matters a lot. It matters a ton, uh, particularly when it comes to sizing, the sizing that you're going to choose for your seabed. Um, even in, air, in, in spots like this, there's still the question of who has range advantage. You know, we were the one that made the pre-flop raise. They took the passive action of calling. Um, so we're uncapped and they're capped. And um, when you just think of all the hands that they could have, this board misses a lot of them. And especially given the circumstances that we're talking about in this spot, where there's a fairly large pre-flop bet, you are in an ICM situation. They shouldn't be continuing so widely that they have a ton of fives and fours in their range. And we're blocking a lot of the spades that they'd like to be continuing by having an ace in our hand and a jack on the board. So it really, it, there is a lot of those kind of dry, you know, backdoor straight hands, maybe one pair of hands here. Um, and we can, we can put that range in some difficulty uh, by betting here. And one, one last thing about sizing here, this is a, when you think about this situation, this is a very hard board for our opponent to raise us on. Hmm. Um, they can't have ace jack. Maybe, I mean, maybe they can, but it, it's pretty rare that they'll have ace jack. They certainly can't have jacks. Yep. Um, they probably can have fives and fours, so they can have a couple of sets, but we have all of that, right? We have, we have fours, we have fives, we have jacks, we have ace jack. Um, so it's, it's a pretty, and we have the ace of spades in our hand. Mm -hmm. So like the amount of hands that they, I mean, they can maybe raise us if they have like six, seven of spades or something like that, then get kind of spicy right. with something like that. But that, that when we do our bet, when we make our C bet here, that's another reason why going small here, because it accomplishes those folds. And sometimes people will say, oh yeah, but if I make a small bet, they're just going to check raise me. Uh, or sorry, it wouldn't be a check, but they're just going to raise me, right? But um, it's not I, that's not going to happen very often on this board in this spot. Yeah, it's a great point. There's just not a lot of those natural bluffs that there would be in other circumstances. And Chris makes a great, great point there that is, you know, we don't think about this often enough, but if you can accomplish the same amount of fold equity with a smaller bet, you should. <laughs> yeah. And and the, the the thing that we're mostly worried about is that it's going to get expressed as weakness and that they're going to raise us with, you know, a bunch of stuff. If you can be thoughtful about the board texture and sort of analyze their range a little bit like Chris has done here and say, well, they don't have that many candidates to raise us light. Um, when they do raise, even a, a thoughtful player, you know, you can kind of read that as as a stronger action than, than it would be on other boards or in other circumstances. So that that should make for some easier decisions. I really like that point. So uh, we do make the larger bet. It gets called. Um, turn comes the nine of spades. So let's talk about checking versus betting here. Yeah. Uh, who wants to jump in? Well, I, I'll, I'll just jump in really quickly here because this is what I wrote in the post too. I think our decision here, so one of the things that we want to think about, especially on boards that complete draws, right? So when we have uh, straight draws or flush draws, boards that complete draws is how would I play this if I made a draw, right? And if we're, and for me, if you can honestly say to yourself, and this is honestly what I would say, is that if I made the nut flush on this, I would be checking it. And if I made weaker flushes, I'd probably be betting them. And so since I am, I have the ace of spades and I may want to start to represent that nut flush, I really like this check. But if, if Louis is a player who would bet his nut flush here, then I hate this check. And I think that's part of what we want to be thinking about in these decisions. We have to be thinking about how am I, if I had, you know, ace, 
which what are ace three of spades right what how would i play this and if i'm going to check that then i love to check when we have the ace of spades when we've got ace of, ace of spades with a with you know not two spades but if we're you know so that's that's how i would start that's how i start thinking about this cuz that's going to be how i'm going to be thinking about it after our villain bets as well mm -hmm. yep that makes a lot of sense taylor yeah i i agree with that cuz i was thinking through this and uh my thought was hey i want to be betting here all the time like i got the ace of spades here i want to be betting but to chris's point if i have ace three of spades or if i've got the the nut flush here I am betting here and I'm betting small. And that's exactly what I want to do here with my ace of spades, eight of whatever else that I have in my hand. Um, so like I wanted to go smaller on the flop, uh, I'd be betting smaller here too, bigger than I did before. So if I went 40K before here, I'm going like 100, 110 or something like that. Um, and I just want to keep putting pressure on because uh, honestly, what I like about taking that approach is say I go 110K in my villain calls here and the river is nothing too scary. It's not like another Jack, um, maybe not another four or five, but anything, almost anything else. Um, whether it's a spade or not, I can go huge on the river here because uh, my opponent kind of capped his range. Like if he had, like we know he doesn't have the nut flush. So he, if he's got a flush, it's like a baby flush, um, which if they have a baby flush, I'm assuming they're going to raise the turn bet because they're scared about river cards that are going to come. Uh, so their range kind of gets capped and I can go huge on rivers. Um, if it, assuming it goes, I bet small and they check turn my ace of spades is like the perfect like blocker uh, bluff to have. So like, that's my approach of how I want to like approach this hand is like, I'm, I'm not checking this here because I want to go small and get them to call and just kind of like cap their range uh, and then allow me to go huge on reverse. Yeah. And part, part of the, the thinking there, I think is it, it, this can be opponent dependent, right? And like, mm. if we have a pretty, um, if I have an aggressive opponent who um, and we all know this kind of opponent, right? The kind that where when you check to them, when you show any amount of weakness, they see that as the green light for them to just take down the pot, whether they got it or not. Um, then, then I really like the check um, here. But if we've got an opponent that, you know, isn't going to, if we're not going to be able to capture any bluffs by checking here, then I do like a bet. Yeah, I like that. Those are all really good points. Um, so what ends up happening, as we say, so our hero, uh, Louis Hillman here, checks and the villain bets 200,000 into a pot of 300,000. So a two thirds pot bet. And I mean, I guess theoretically, <laughs> like we talked about last week, we could fold or we could call or we could raise. Those are the three outcomes. Um, just like last week where we were talking with uh, Mikey Aces about uh, his 10-10 hand, calling feels like the worst choice out of the three of them essentially drawing to a fourth spade oh no taylor says <laughs> taylor i don't want to i don't want to ruin it but i'm going to be on team call uh here okay all right sweet um so you're all right well let's let's explore that then because i was just gonna essentially discount it but um talk to me about team call in the circumstance here so you've got uh, essentially you've got ace high and, and a redraw to the nut flush but you mm -hmm. also have the nut flush blockers. So you've got a chance to play in the sandbox a little bit here. Um, you check villain leads two thirds. Sell me on a call. Uh, so our opponent here, um, no matter what they have, we can outdraw them. Like no yeah. matter what, give them any hand that they have and we can outdraw them. It's not necessarily saying we're going to, but I think it's something like 25% of the time we're going to like hit the nuts. It's a little bit less. It's like 20%, right? Yeah, um, so, I mean, just talk about pot odds, right? I have to call 200K to potentially win the 50K in there. Okay, you're not quite there. Uh, so you need some other equity, but obviously there's going to be implied odds uh, on the river should you hit anything. Um, and I think 
if so there's different instances right we're either like currently behind or there's a potential that our opponent is just bluffing us like this is a capable opponent they are going to have bluffs in current hands that we beat i think a lot of those include hands like queen 10 potentially like king queen um there's potentially some instances where they hit they just have like a single pair uh which our ace is probably going to be good then um obviously the ace can't be a spade so that that won't change anything so we just hit like a, a naked ace so there's a chance of that too so i think just like pure odds we're probably not there but implied odds like i think we for sure have it once we think about that um and I think the tough part about when you see these spots, you have to call 200K. What goes on in your head is it like rings alarm bells. You're like, oh no, I'm going to be facing an all in and I'm going to be put to my tournament life uh, on the river here. You're going to have a ton of easy decisions on the river, in my opinion. Um, I think it, the scariest of which is like an ace of hearts comes out and then you have to decide, okay, do they have a set or two pair? Uh, and then I'm just calling to lose here, but I think it's pretty comfortable. I, I guess I haven't really thought about that too much. I was going to say it's pretty comfortable, but I think you probably just have to suck it up and call there. All the other spades, you're in a really good spot and everything else. If you miss easy fold, you've got ace high, uh, just let them have it. If they find the triple barrel, plus there's a chance that they just check back their queen tens when they miss on the river and you win with ace high and you scoop a pot that you almost never, never should have. So Honestly, like I, I see a lot of good things about calling here. Um, I honestly hate to jam. Uh, I would never jam here. I would say, no, 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 don't do this. Um, Cause you're gonna you just let yourself play better by calling and then see a river and then decide. Um, I think jamming, you just let them play too well against you. So um, fold is probably the middle option, but I'm, I'm all for team call here. I, I'm going to jump in, and I, I love what Taylor's saying, and he might have even convinced me. However, I want to bring up one point about this that really makes me uh, lean towards the jam, um, and that is villain sizing. Um, villain goes, so this is this is an out-of-flow play, right? If we kind of go back to the whole way this, this, uh, this, this hand played out, we, uh, we open, we got called. We bet pretty big. We all agreed it was like bigger than most of us would go. And we got called. And then we go to a turn where we check and we show some, some weakness. And I feel like when, I'm a, when our villain then goes two thirds pot into this spot, that to me, when I'm thinking about that, when I, I don't know who this exact player we're talking about here, but I have this vision of this player in my head that is the kind that attacks weakness. And this is the exact kind of size that they use too. It's like, go away. You don't, you just checked, you're weak, go away. And to me, that screams, because I don't have much, um, is what that's, you know, this is not like I'm betting really big with my, now they might be betting scared with their baby flush, but I, I kind of discount that as much as they are doing this with like, a weak jack, or maybe they turned a nine, you know, um, so they had like 10, nine on this board that they, they called along with and they, like they, they turned a nine and now it's like, get out of my pot. And what I really don't like to do, what I like to really do with that kind of opponent is disappoint them. Um, and if they're sitting there with, you know, a nine, if they've hit a nine or they had a jet, like a weak Jack, that's kind of come to this point, which seems like that's what this really feels like to me. I think we can accomplish a ton through a jam. And when we call, then it's going to go check, check a lot. If we don't hit our spade, it's going to go check, check a lot. And we're going to lose a lot. Now we may, you're right. They may have queen 10 and we may sometimes scoop it, but I think more often we're going to lose this pot to these sort of like pairs that wanted us to go away. And I, I, I really like, and then when called, if we ever get called by those hands, we still have all the outs of that we were talking about, which we may not have on the river. So I'm probably jamming here for, if this is the right villain. Hey, Bob, good points. You... Uh, oh, sorry. I just wanted no. to ask Chris a 
question though because when i when i see this like i don't put too many like i don't think they ever do this with a four or five just a pair of that like even go this size so to me this is very like polar you think even nines could potentially be in there i've Um, i've seen players like that um yeah the one the ones that are like oh okay mr weak sauce you you took your seabed and then you check back but I'm 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 the alpha at this table, and you're you know you're gonna pay attention to me now. And I just turned a nine, so let's go. So and okay. th- that that's the kind of player that I want to stuff it back in their face. <laughs> I so I know exactly who uh, Louis is talking about here, and I played with them at the Fall Poker Classic, and I highly doubt they have a nine here, just as, based off what I know. So. Um, that's my own personal read of the situation gotcha. Gotcha. which uh well yeah. and i don't know who the player is so you you would know better than me yeah but anyways so, so i, I what, think that like so, adds into a lot of it but yeah go ahead rob so you guys what do you think he's doing this with that what what kind of hands is he doing this is it strictly queen 10 or a jack is it another um flush draw with a king or queen of spades um, what is he what is he doing this with? does he really have a hand or is or does he not and if he doesn't have a hand we're beating everything that he has right now because if he has no pairs we've got ace high and unless he has you know an ace nine or better you know we've got him beat right <clears throat> so what is he doing this with a lot of times you think about um, you want to think about what are the blockers that you have to the bluffs. We have the main blocker to the bluff, which is the ace of spades, right? So a lot of times when you're thinking in these spots, you're thinking, okay, what is he bluffing with? What can I beat right now? What am I ahead of right now? Well, you're ahead of any flush draw that he has. And you're ahead of any non-paired hand that he has for most of them to his very few non-paired hands that you're behind. So um, yeah, there's a whole, now to Chris's point, it's more about the player. Is this player capable of doing a, just an all out bluff because you showed a sign of weakness? And if that's the case, I agree with Chris 100%. Throw it back in his face. You still have the redraw. If he doesn't happen to have a jack, well, we still can draw an ace or any spade. Um, the chances of him doing this with a flush, I think a made flush, might bet a little smaller in this spot, trying to get a call from somebody that doesn't have a flush. Because he knows that we don't have a flush because in his mind, if we had a flush, we would have bet the turn. If we would have turned the flush, Nine times out of 10, people are going to bet that to try to get some more value. So how tricky are we that we could check a flush in this spot? He's not going to put us on a flush. So he could very easily represent the flush himself and put a big bet out there to Chris's point, a go away bet. So I think he there's a whole bunch of garbage in his range right now that can't call an all-in bet and the better the player you know the more likely they are to have hands that can play as a bet fold that you know a bet fold is not something that less experienced players are very comfortable with having in their game tree but um it's a super savvy way to play poker (laughs) sort of uh you get you get to let your opponent define the range a bit and you get to uh a lot of good things happen when you have a bet fold uh, decision, you know, option available to you. Taylor, you unmuted there. What? Uh, what yeah, I, I was just gonna say, just given the um, description we have of this opponent, be they're a really good player, uh, like really good. Uh, so I think on the flop, we're gonna fold out a lot of their junk, uh, and then what they get to the turn with here, I think connects in like a lot of like medium ish ways. And then when they take this line to me, it it seems very like very strong. Uh, and I think we hold the like number one bluff card for them to have. So like we actually have a blocker that like hurts us in this situation. So I'm actually kind of thinking about it in a little bit of the opposite way as Rob. Like 
you you essentially are kind of they're setting themselves up in like a I have a total bluff uh, or uh, I've got a strong made hand. And I think the total bluffs that take this still try to have some sort of equity. They're not going to just take this with like king six of hearts. They're going to have something that like gives them an option. I think they very well could have a hand like king queen with one of those being a spade. I think that definitely makes a lot of sense here because then they have a gut shot draw plus a flush draw uh, plus two overs uh, to the board. And that would be like a hand that we currently beat. Uh, but I think us having the ace of spades actually hurts their bluffing range uh, and actually strengthens the the remaining, the proportion that you think of uh, in terms of like the value hands that they have here. So I think it, it weights a little bit more towards the top pairs, the two pairs, the made flushes that are on the smaller side. And that's what gives me pause. And that's why I don't want to take the jam route. And I, I agree with that 100%. I think that we're, we're blocking a lot of his bluffs. I was talking more in response to the type of player that may take this action. Mm -hmm. um, I agree with you 100%. He doesn't have as many bluffs because we're blocking those numbers of bluffs. Uh, this bet size requires him to have not as many bluffs as if he had gone full pot, obviously. If he had gone full pot, he'd have to have 33% of his hands would have to be bluffs. So here it's even less than that, maybe like 25% or something like that. So yeah, he doesn't have a lot of bluffs and we're blocking a lot of those bluffs. So I agree with you there. I'm just saying that if this is the kind of player that is going to pounce on somebody's weakness, mm -hmm. then there is a possibility that you could put that back in his face. Yeah, and I, I'm not saying he is or not. I'd like to know more about him to know that. Yeah, and so Taylor, you know the player specifically, and this may be the wrong kind of analysis, but but um, for me, it's kind of even less about the ace of spades blocking the bluffs, because what I would be concerned about, and this this is kind of like where my mind is, is that there are player types that will do this with marginal value. They're polarizing themselves, but they're polarizing themselves because they want you to just be like, okay, you checked, you don't have anything. And th so like, I do think that there, there are, there's a decent number in the player pool, certainly in the, the local player pool that will uh, go after it on a, on a week, you know, after you make your C bet and then you check the turn and then they'll go after you on the, or I would check the turn, then they'll go after you on the turn and they'll do, I think they will do that with a Jack and they'll do that when they even flop a nine here, because you had your chance, you had your chance to bet your Jack and you didn't, or you, I mean, you did, but then you didn't bet it again when you still had top pair. So now, now they're going to go after you even with a nine and though that I'm, I'm less concerned about like, oh, they don't have the single spades. Although I do think that's a candidate here. I want to attack. I mean, cause Jacks and nines are in just they hate their lives when this gets shoved back into their face. I mean, it's just like, there's nothing they can do really. I mean, I guess like if you're sitting there with like Jack 10 or queen Jack here and you're just like, Oh, uh, I hate you, <laughs> but you're probably folding. Right. And so that's what I want to attack. So I've heard some arguments for um, shoving against this, uh, bet. I've heard some arguments for calling. Um, I've heard some comments about the strength of our opponent's range. Does anyone want to advocate for a fold here, a check fold? I'm not seeing a lot of people unmuting. So is there a consensus to check calling or check raising? Here, Taylor, you unmuted, jump in. I was going to say, like, I I mentioned this before. I, in my power ranking of it, like, I like calling the best. I like folding the second best and then jamming the least um i think you could definitely create a player type in here where i'm going to take a fold option um, for sure for sure i think if you don't tell me this is you know a really competent player that just won a huge event and me knowing who this is and having played with them and knowing their style like i'm going to give them enough credit to say, hey, you've got some bluffs in here too. But there are some people that only take this line with value. And then I think you just can, 
you can just pitch it, even though calling and trying to go after those implied odds is great. Um, I, I think you can definitely find folds. Yeah, I think I, I think I agree there that you can definitely find folds here um, versus certain player types because we hold the blocker to the most common bluffs that a person would have here. And the fact that um, you don't have, you know, we only have one more card. It's not like we're calling with a flush draw on the flop. We only have one more card. So that really, you know, our our odds of hitting our flush are really way down there. Now we still could hit the ace, but there's only three aces left that we know about. So it's, you know, our odds of actually hitting a hand that's going to beat somebody that's doing this with value right now are very, very small. So this is a two thirds pot bet. And I think we need a little bit, we need a little bit more strength to just call here if we assume that he's doing this with value. And can you get him to fold the jack? But mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, that's the other qu the thing that came up to me when Taylor was just talking about um, designing a, an opponent who we might fold to here because they're only doing this with strength. Those kind of players are also not good at making savvy laydowns. So they're not a good candidate to choose for like a semi-bluff uh, shove in, as well. So that, that tracks perfectly. Um, when I came into this, I was, I mean nut flush blocker on a, a board like this with this action like this is a bluff Storini special baby let's get it in the middle let's dance let's let god sort it out um but i i i really i mean i, I i'm coming around to these other ways of thinking about it um this, i'm glad i said at the top of the show like i get to host them i get to host the podcast but these guys know a lot more about poker than i do uh so i've really enjoyed kind of learning along with uh, these gentlemen tonight any other thoughts before we close this out? Yeah, Taylor, jump in. I, I think this is the prime opportunity for us uh, to do our hand reading skills if we can. Louis said he'll post what the oh, villain yeah. had. That's There's right. Four of us here. Why don't we all uh, take a guess on what villain was holding? Not only us, but if you're listening to this show, it's coming out in February. Um, why don't you respond to this? Uh, there's going to be a tweet that comes out in February announcing that this podcast episode has gone out. Um, respond to that tweet and share your guess for what our opponent had. And whoever, if anyone gets it correct, we'll check with Louie afterwards. Um, we'll give you a free month of premium membership at rec.poker. So you're allowed to, you can choose one of the ones that we say, or you can come up with your own. We're all going to put our guests out here. Um, and if, and we'll check with Louie, we'll find out what the actual hand was. Actually, I guess I should tell him not to post it in the forums over the next few weeks anyway. So I'll make a little note to do that in the meantime. Uh, but yeah, let's start. Uh, Taylor, it sounds like you've got an idea of what you think it might be. I'll throw my guess out there first. I'll say uh, Jack nine. Turn two mm. pair. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go next? I'll, I'll go That's next. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Chris, come on. Chris, what, what are you I was. I was just thinking, I, I'm, well. close to, I'm close to that, but I think it's uh, Jack 10 with the 10 of spades. Mm. Mm -hmm. Or well, 10 nine like, with the 10 of spades. Since he's already picked Jack nine. <laughs> I'm going to pick Queen Jack with the Queen of Spades. I like that. I think if he had a flush draw on the flop, he would have raised. And I think if he had a set on the flop, he would have raised. So those are some good candidates. I think I'm going to go Queen 10 with the Queen of Spades. What do we got? We're all in the yeah. same territory here, but we left people a lot of room around the edges there to make some. Right. I thought I thought about Ace Nine. I did think about Ace Nine, so that's still available out there, folks. So, you never know. and uh, how about this? Uh, which of those are folding to a jam? Ooh, not well, mine. not Jack Nine. Not Jack Nine. And uh, Ten Nine, I think does. It does. That was one of them, right? And then Jack Ten with the Ten Jack. of Spades. Stays. How about Queen Jack with the Queen of Spades? Stays. Calls. Yeah, I think so. Too. He calls. I think, I think so. so too. That's a, that's That'd be a good, great if he did. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good exercise. Then all we need to do is hit an ace or a spade and we win. Right. Yep. If he has two pair, that ace doesn't do us any good at all. 
true. It's true. And it might even counterfeit us if uh if he oh it would be hard for him to fill up on that run out with those with those cards. But um yeah, four of spades, I guess he has a set. All right. Well, this has been very cool. So uh folks, like I say, this will come out in a sort of like mid to late February, I believe. Uh thanks to Louis Hillman for uh this excellent post and for all uh his contributions to Rec Poker and to Poker Twitter. Um Put your guests out there. I'll make it, it and uh, tweet at me. I'm I'm at Rec Poker Jim on Twitter. Just in case you can't find the uh, the tweet that announces this post. If you're listening to this, uh, you should probably hit me up and also hit up the Rec Poker account. So at Rec Poker and at Rec Poker Jim, and uh, just put your guess for what the opponent might have here. And let's give people until Marek Madness starts. And then uh, once Marek Madness starts, we'll do uh, we'll do the grand reveal and we'll award a prize. Taylor, why don't we just take a minute to kind of talk about Marek Madness because that's going to be coming up right around the corner and people might want to know uh, how much fun they're about to have and uh, what how how we do it and what's going down. Sure, I'll go through it quick. Uh, so Marek Madness is our version of a heads up tournament bracket, similar to March Madness in the NCAA basketball uh, space. Uh, we stream all the matchups live on Twitch. Uh, so if you want to watch all the matchups that we play in Marek Madness, join us Wednesday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. Uh, we'll be doing all those. We'll have commentary for all the matches. We've got 16 people competing in this. Uh, so there will be 15 matchups that we play all throughout March. If it's a Wednesday in March at 9 p.m. Eastern, there's Ma Rec Madness happening at our Twitch channel, which is twitch.tv slash rec poker. Taylor, is it Thursdays in March? Because the other streaming schedule is on Wednesdays. That's right. I'm sorry, I forgot. I'm <laughs> going to stream normally on Wednesdays. That's my yeah. normal schedule uh, to stream on Wednesdays. All, all year round, you can catch Taylor streaming on Wednesday nights, including in March. But we've actually got a whole special in March, right. Marek Madness Thursday You're nights. You're right. I'm sorry. I got so used to switching my mind to streaming is on Wednesdays. But that's when <laughs> I stream the home game on Twitch at twitch.tv slash rec poker. So join for that, too. Uh, but then on Thursdays, we will do the Marek Madness matchups. Uh, so every Thursday in March, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central, tune in. Uh, it'll be a fun time. It sure will. And uh, the calendar gods have smiled on us and they've given us uh, five Thursdays in March, which is good because it takes five series of matches to get through this ladder all the way down to our heads up finale which will be a best two out of three. And we're going to have a special guest uh, poker celebrity co-commentator for that uh, session. We're still working out some details, but um, this has been a just a super fun thing we do every year. Taylor does virtually all the heavy lifting on this, uh, which makes it one of my favorite features that we do here at Rec Poker. Um, it's a lot of fun. We, uh, it's at, I think at the time of listening, it's too late to qualify because we run uh, qualifiers throughout the year, heads up battles, uh, points races, uh, random draws. And um, I, I believe, has everyone been selected already, uh, Taylor, at this point? Uh, yes. Uh, by the time everyone's hearing this, everyone's been selected, but we're still kind of yeah. doing the logistics in our pre-recording stages. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, if you want to win your way into Malrec Madness, uh, you do so in uh, June, September, and December. Uh, we do uh, Heads Up Brackets, one of the tournaments on Saturdays. I think it's the second or third Saturday of the month, third. Uh, the third Saturday of each of those months, we do a heads up bracket. You have to register in advance because heads up brackets close the registration as soon as it starts. So you have to pre-register, but every winner uh, of those has been contacted and invited to play in Marek Madness. So anyone is possible to play in Marek Madness. You just have to go out there and win those tournaments. And then you can play against a whole bunch of these fun people from the Wrecking Crew and the podcast. That's right. Talk about bragging rights. Uh, we've had some fun uh, times coming through this and doing the uh, commentating live uh, while we're watching the action unfold has been super fun. We get different people in the booth. We have a great time with that. And if you go to our uh, YouTube channel, uh, just Rec Poker community on YouTube, it's and they've got YouTube handles now. It's at Rec Poker on YouTube. It's a whole new world. Um, you can go and see videos from previous years 
of the action, the commentary, the matches. And uh, you can see I, I had a great time uh, commentating with Ryan LaPlante uh, a little while ago. Um, we've we've gotten different Wrecking Crew members in there um, to have some fun and enjoy it. And it will all be streamed every Thursday night in March it, or Marec um, at nine o'clock Eastern. So come and check that out for free. Uh, we might even give away a couple prizes. You never know. That happens from time to time. Jim, remind me who won last year. Oh, no. Who? Oh, wait. Wasn't it this guy right over here? Oh, you don't know. Oh, that was the year before. before. I think, so, I think it, it was Somsky. 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 guy. Yeah. Yep. It was Somsky. Now, the year before, it was, I believe it was our man Chris, wasn't it? No, it was no, Taylor. no, no, no. <laughs> Taylor, Taylor, <laughs> Taylor, Taylor, right? Taylor versus Chris heads up for the championship. Okay, and we went deep into the third match yes. uh, to decide a winner. It, it was a long battle. So that was a ton of fun. Uh, but last year, Poker Geek MN, John Somsky is our uh, reigning champion. Thought, yep. yep. And, so and that's um, the kind of competition you guys are going to be up against. Anybody who plays in this, you're not, it's not, a, it's not a, it's a very game. tough field. It's very, very, very tough. tough. Very t- no matchup is a, is a walk. No, exactly. no soft seats. Um, and, it, and, and it, but there is some fun. Uh, we, we typically shoot some kind of trash talking videos, which for John Somsky, the most humble guy in poker, his trash talk videos are like, we're both going to try our best and you're probably going to win, but you know, we're going to have a great time doing it. And congratulations in advance. <laughs> but some of them have a little bite in them you never know you never know what's going to happen here at rec poker so um all right folks thank you so much for your ears thank you for your subscription to the podcast uh thanks for checking out the youtube channel and just thanks for being uh people out there that love the world of poker lord knows we need more of those i'm happy to be one of them I'm happy to be part of this wrecking crew with Chris and Rob and Taylor. Uh, we're happy to be supported by the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. And you, the podcast listeners, have a great week, and we'll see you again soon.